talks about them going off and drinking together. Is there like a whole world out there for us to discover of books that look like that if we just go looking for it? Um, if, if you compare this, the, 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 the other major work about the Kutsk in that school that I know is, and, and it's, it's a tremendous book, is Abraham Joshua Heschel's book about Kutsk. Uh, very powerful, but it's very much Heschel's Kutsk. You can't, somebody can't tell what's Kutsk and what's Heschel in it. Uh, and, and a lot of it is, is, is in the world of ideas. Um, on the other hand, there are several novels. Uh, um, Opatasha's in Polish, in Polish Woods is about Kutsk, and it was, it was kind of a favorite theme for Yiddish writers in the early 20th century. We'll open up the floor if anyone has some questions. Yes? These are jokes that you tell in English, but then you tell a punchline in Yiddish, and then the punchline can't be translated to somebody who doesn't speak Yiddish effectively. Right. It's, it's not so much an inducement to learning Yiddish as a punishment for not knowing <laughs> So this is a joke that my dad, my dad in particular remembered, um, uh, that, that, um, that, that my Zane would say. So um, there's a, a, a chief on the American plains is out hunting for buffalo. He's hunting for days. He's like going without food. He's going without water, just like traveling across the plains. And then, you know, it's day after day with no luck, no buffalo. And finally, it's early morning. He looks out and peering off into the distance. He sees, he sees the buffalo. And this is great. And so he's sneaking up in the tall, tall grass to try and, to try and catch the buffalo. He goes and he reaches down and he reaches into his into his side, to his belt, and he pulls it out and he looks at me and he goes, the milk is Uh, a 
of the events that I, that I read about, Simcha Bunim, was also famous. Uh, they, they called him the Daesh. Anybody? That means the, the modern, the modern Jew, because he had been in Danzig. He, he was a full trained pharmacist. He knew Polish. He played the guitar. He played and played cards. He had been to the theater, and then he became the Rebbe. Um, and, and even as recently as uh, in our generation, the current Boyana Rebbe was has a secular educator, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, but were called back in to lead, and then had to um, downplay that aspect of their lives. But it certainly, but it certainly feeds into their extraordinary leadership. And I'm thinking for the first time, actually, that part of the reason why Hasidism remains a vital tradition today is that many of the leaders had unconventional education. Right. So, 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 so these, these moves go in several directions. Right. Just, just, were, you, were you also saying that um, someone like Blucher had to become because he was next in line? I, I'm while, guessing. Yeah. While Menashe was the youngest child, yeah, so he, 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 he had a brother who could become the Rebbe, so the pressure was different upon him and gave him opportunities to be the beloved youngest son of the Rebbe, and at the same time to explore a world as he had to keep, I mean, you saw his, he kept moving, and it wasn't because most of those early moves were moves out of necessity because of the, the political situation with Russia, and then later, uh, so he was exposed to things that maybe his oldest brother never ever saw and never imagined that he embraced. But we also, we don't know the story of his first marriage and, and the divorce there, and from which he then moved, moved to Warsaw. So we don't actually know what, what the story there was, and maybe there's a very personal story as well. Um, on my grandmother, his, his wife's side, you know, she lived un, into her 90s, so we, we knew her all the way through, through adulthood. And she would actually talk about leaving you know, her family's kind of more traditional background uh, in, in a way that I don't think we, we always think about the workers, and that it was full of superstition. That you know, side by side with religious observance was like divics and and ghosts and amulets, like you've heard about, and and that was just a part of daily life among the religious. And it was that part that I think, as um, people like my grandmother felt like they were getting this secular education, they were saying these two worlds don't go together at all. There wasn't a sense of um, you, know, you can kind of have both at the same time because. The, 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 she just did also like Narish kite and, and superstition to her. Um, I, want, I want to say one thing about Simcha Bunim. Um, is, uh, is, I don't know if you mentioned this story. There's a very famous story of Simcha Bunim um, that uh, I think is inspirational that I, I've kept with me all the time. Um, he, he has a saying that um, a person should have uh, two pockets. Um, you mentioned this in the book, actually. And in one pocket, it should be written a piece of paper that says, the, the whole world was created for my sake. The whole world was created for my sake. And in the other pocket, you should have a note that says, I am nothing but dust and ashes. And then at the opportune moment, you should take out the appropriate note from the pocket. So if you're feeling small, and you're feeling like you know, it, it, there's, not, there's not much that matters, take out the note that says, the whole world was created for my sake. And if you're feeling like one of those moments where your ego is getting a little bit too big, take out the one that reminds you, I am nothing but dust and ashes. I always have both, both notes in both pockets. And if anybody knows a good silversmith, I really want to you know, get somebody to get little, little pieces of metal with those inscribed on, inscribed on them. Because that's always struck me that that's a good way to keep in balance. I'll do it for you. Okay, there you go, shit. Okay. Yes. yes. Heschel at J. 
ATS, and heard some of the stories about the wedding in Australia and about the Hasidic Cossacks from his mouth. Um, obviously, when you're talking about uh, the, the five Hasidim at the inn and, and the particular Hasidim that they had and the conversations that they had, it's, it's filled in. But my overall sense is that this is informed by, by, by deep love for that world, by a profound knowledge of that world, and a profound concern for representing it accurately. And, and also, I'll just say, they, they, even today, like when I saw my cousins and family out in Borough Park, like they tell these stories about their family history going back generation after generation, like the way that we would tell, you know, stories like, like Wizard of Oz or something like that. It's just, it's, it's part of the language that they speak, is to tell these family stories. It's, it's, the, it's the main corpus of like what they think, think about in terms of storytelling. Did you want to have? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I thought something that was really interesting, and in, 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 in a way it goes with that fiction versus nonfiction question, the writing itself, the style of the writing, reminded me of Hunter S. Thompson and Jack Kerouac, and who were writing, I think, around the same time. And, you know, it, which kind of makes your grandfather, you know, the sort of uh, Hunter S. Thompson of the Hasidic world. <laughs> and, uh, by, 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 the, by the way, it's very clear from the chapter structure that this must have been serialized in the Yiddish paper, okay. so yeah, yeah. chapter of the week. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, okay, so um, uh, we're going we're gonna to wrap, wrap it up in just a minute. Uh, I think that um, our Zadi would, would be delighted if the way that we were to close this was by singing a nigun together and kind of sending ourselves out with, with a, a celebratory song. So um, it, it, uh, I'm just reminded of the book signing uh, with Jonathan in the lobby after. I just want to thank all of you so much for being here today um, and the Skirball Center for hosting. And um, we're going we're to close with a nigun and then we'll, we'll hear uh, the voices off of the real trail afterwards.